So right. let me welcome everyone on our weekly colloquium. Today, our guest is John Casamilia from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And let me say a few words about John. So John did his PhD in 2001 in Finland with Professor Suominen. Then he did uh, several postdocs, for instance, one in, uh, in Innsbruck with uh, Professor Brigel. Then from 2010, he's a, a professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, where he is also the head of uh, theoretical physics unit and co-leader of quantum information group, as far as I noticed. And yeah. uh, let me just add that my, my wife did a PhD in this group. So John will tell us about sequential analysis in the quantum realm. The microphone is yours, John. Okay, thank you, Remik. Uh, thank you, the organizers, for in inviting me. It's really a, an honor to speak to you today. It would be even nicer to be there, but now this is a, a hard time, so now so it's it's also good that we learn to to exploit these uh, online things, which is maybe it wouldn't be possible to have this talk at all. I'm not the head of the theoretical physics unit anymore, so it means also that I have more time for, for research, which is good. So I, I was asked that this was, I understand, for the whole theoretical physics institute. So I was asked to be quite a uh, start from, from scratch. And maybe I took it too literally because I, I will start, start really from, from the very bottom of, of classical statistical inference in a way. Okay. If it becomes too trivial, I, I don't mind uh, improvising or changing or accelerating. Also, I don't mind if you interrupt me during the talk, just open your, your mic and, and just ask whatever. Or comment. So the, the talk is about quantum sequential analysis. Uh, sequential analysis has been for some time already, as long as statistical inference almost, like from the times of Bob and so on. Uh, but in the quantum realm, it hasn't been exploited. Okay, so uh, and, and I, I will first try to, to explain a little bit what is uh, classical hypothesis testing, okay, and what are the types of tools and methods you use them, you use there. And, and, and then go to the quantum regime, and they also introduce a sequential part, okay, in one go. So the hypothesis testing comes, you have here the, the typical setting, no? uh, two coins, two types of coins, and you know, uh, you know them, and you know you have these golden ones, which have a bias P, and you have the silver ones, which have a bias Q. Of course, you don't see the color, say, but the bias are differences, different, okay? So the, the thing is that you, you toss the coin many times, and then based on the number of, of heads and tails of the outcomes, in the end, the only relevant statistic is the number of heads and tails, uh, you have to decide if it was coin A or coin B, okay? That's a, that's a general thing. Um, and then this means that, so for example, if, if coin A gives you a binomial distribution like this, and coin B gives you a binomial distribution like this, then in the end, after throwing the coin, you will not have these distributions. What you will have is just one point here. Okay, so you get a given number of, of heads, say. And now based on this, you have to decide it was coin A or coin B, just with this number. Okay, and now here you clearly see that uh, if you get, for example, this point, coin B gives this point with a very high probability, while, while coin A gives this, this number of heads with a low probability. So it's quite natural that you will guess for the most likely uh, coin. And this will be actually the optimal choice. Now, if you look at what is the, the probability of making a, an error in this assessment, which is possible because it could be that this coin gives rise to this event. If you look, the, the, the error is actually the area under this curve, okay? And you probably also know that if, if you cause a coin more and more times, this, these peaks become more narrow and narrower. So this overlap becomes smaller and smaller. Okay, and actually it becomes exponentially small. So the whole field of, of uh, hypothesis testing deals about really these exponential rates, how they go. So let me, I think I have, uh, yes. So here you see the, the probability of error as a number of, of heads and tails. Okay, and you see it looks quite like an exponential. It, if you zoom it, it has this, this a bit of structure here in a very non-trivial dependence on the N and P and Q, of course. But if you look at the, at the exponent, so this goes like an, like an exponential essentially. So if, if you pop down this exponent, exponent here by doing the log and divided by N, then you see that as you increase N, this goes to a constant. Okay, this is this, this uh, exponential rate here. 
okay? And this constant, of course, it's very informative. It tells you the, the features of this exponential, how it goes without caring too much about this, this structure here, which is good. We don't want too much information. We want to know how things scale. And also this exponent can be used as a, if you want a, like a distinguishability, distinguishability measure between distributions. So a kind of distance that tells you how far are two distributions or how far are two hypotheses from each other. And it's one which is operational because it, it literally tells you how hard is to distinguish these two hypotheses. Okay. Now, what, what we will do now in, in, in this talk entails a situation where you, you don't throw the coins all together, but you throw them by, one by one. Okay. Uh, classically, this maybe it's not uh, such a difference no? because the results are the same. You're sampling an NID distribution. The only difference maybe comes from the fact that uh, classically, that if, if you care, if, each, if throwing a coin has a cost for you, each time you throw it, there might be the case that you throw a number of coins and you get the sequence of events, which is super informative for you. Okay, and then you decide to stop. You don't spend more coins. You say, I have enough information. I can make my assessment. I don't want more coins. It could be that you get some sequence of outcomes, which is not uh, so informative and you decide to continue. Okay, and this possibility of stopping or continuing in the end makes that the number of samples that you uh, spend for a given task for achieving a given error probability is a random number and becomes a, a, a random variable, okay? And the whole field of, of uh, sequential analysis is about studying the statistics of this random number, the n, okay? Now, we will go to the quantum and you have the same problem that you have now spins or qubits or whatever, and I can give them to you one by one. And here, of course, it changes also because uh, the distributions themselves in the classical case are given, it's all passive, it's all data processing. In the quantum scenario, you have to choose what measurement to make. And of course, if you do it sequentially, the information that you get at this step, you might use it for choosing the measurement in the next step, or you can make a weak measurement here and then do a collective measurement on, on several copies, okay? It becomes much more rich and much more difficult to study also what, what you can do in the quantum case. Okay, so let's, let's, let's move on to the classical hypothesis testing. Uh, also introduce a, a bit the general framework. Again, you have like each hypothesis, the underlying, uh, the underlying assumption of course is that uh, each hypothesis means a probability distribution. Okay, hypothesis A, if you're uh, sick or you, if you're healthy, you have a disease, this is modeled as by a probability distribution. Okay, there's a given probability distribution and typically you assume that it's IID and uh, you, you sample from these distributions as we did with the coins. And in the end, based on, the, on, on some particular samples, you have to decide whether you believe hypothesis zero. So for example, this typically the, 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 the nomenclature is you have a, a default hypothesis, typically like being healthy, a default hypothesis and uh, an alternative hypothesis, which is the other one. Okay, and they, they're called hypothesis zero and one. And associated to this, you have two types of errors. You have the type one errors, it's called like this, with, and typically with an alpha. And this is the error that you make where you, uh, where, where the A zero hypothesis is, is, is true, but you reject it. Okay, so it's, it's like a, a false positive. Okay, so you're healthy, but the test tells you that you, you're not. Okay, this is a pain in the neck for you, but it's much worse, for example, to have a false negative. So a guy that has a disease uh, goes and the test says that he's healthy, he can, he can go and, and, and go to work and everything. And this is terrible because it spreads a disease and you cannot uh, save him and so on. So typically in many scenarios, there's kind of a, the, the two types of error are not symmetrical. Okay, so it brings the issue of saying, what is the figure of merit in order to optimize your estimators or your measurements in the quantum case, what do you want to optimize? The standard uh, uh, quantum uh, hypothesis testing scenario is that you make an average. You, you, both hypotheses, rho and sigma, the two states, they mean the same. So you say the probability of error 
is like one half of both diameters. You, you do the average and then you minimize this average. But one could play a different game where um, you say, okay, for example, I want, I want to detect some healthy people. So I want that alpha is not uh, zero. The error is, is smaller than a given epsilon. And now given this, I want to minimize the probability that, um, that I, I detect the, the unhealthy people, okay? So, so you have this symmetric and, uh, and asymmetric scenarios. Okay, so how, how does one deal with these problems? Again, what we want is to, to see what happens in the asymptotic after a lot of samples, typically from one sample, you learn very little, especially in the quantum case that from one state you get just uh, one, one bit in a way. So you want to see in the asymptotic limit, okay? And when you go to asymptotics, classically, and this is again a very old subject and very well studied, I, I make a very fast review just to appreciate also the differences with the quantum case. So a very powerful thing is a method of types, okay? It's, it, it's all quite understandable, okay? The, the, the basic thing is that you have probability distributions, you have some alphabet, so these are the the results of the dice or of the coin, okay? And then you have, you throw and you will get a particular instance. So heads, tails, tails, heads or whatever, some combination, okay? Associated to this X, to this sequence of outcomes, and this is a, a stochastic variable, a sequence of stochastic variables, um, you, you can define a, a type that is called or the empirical distribution. So you count how many A's you get and how many Bs and so on. And you construct something based on these frequencies. So the number of A's divided by N, the number of Bs divided by N and C's. And of course, NA plus NB and NC is the total number of, of coins that you have or of tosses that you have, sorry. But if you look at this, this is like a probability distribution. So these guys are frequencies and they sum up to one. Okay, so th these guys, the, 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 each sequence of outcomes that comes here has a place in the simplex. Okay, the simplex is just uh, the space of probability distributions. Yeah, and so you have P1, P2, and P3, they must add to one. So they, they lie all in this kind of triangle here in this plane. Now the empirical distribution for five tosses, for example, are these guys here. These are all possible combinations of things where N is five. Okay, if I increase the number of, of tosses, I will have a denser set of points. This is with 10, I will have all this. Okay, so I see that now in the simplex, it's a space of my hypothesis in a way. My hypothesis are <laughs> sources, are probability distributions, and also the space of my outcomes. They live in the same space. My outcomes can be, they have a space here. They, have, they correspond to one point, which is empirical. Okay, but not all points here correspond to a type or an empirical distribution because you have a finite sample sampling. If you increase n, this becomes denser and denser and you indeed cover the whole, the whole plane. Okay, so everything that happens in, in, the, in the experiment happens in this plane, okay? So now if you look at the probability distribution, this is the joint probability distribution of, of having a, a full sequence. It can be conveniently written in terms of two quantities, which you probably know, which is the entropy and the relative entropy. Okay, or the Kupa Gleichner distance. So the, the, the most important part here is this for our concerns. This is, this remember, is the probability distribution associated to, uh, to a particular string. So this is empirical distribution. This is the underlying, the, the one that generates your sample, the Q. Okay, so you have two, two, two contributions. You have this one and this one. This essentially tells you the entropy, how many, sequences they are particular sequences are for a given, for, from a given type so you, you you can have a sequence a a a b b b okay and this will correspond to what did we say one half one half and zero this is the empirical distribution but of course you have another sequence which is a b a b a b and this is of the same type they're the same frequencies but uh, it's a different one Okay, and the number of sequences they have of a, of a given type is essentially given by, by this entropy. While this other guy, it's, it tells you 
uh, how rare is your type? So if, if you go to the simplex, I think I have it somewhere here. So this is the, my distribution, the original one that is pr producing something. When I sample from heads and tails, the empirical distribution could be any point in the simplex one, in this grid that we saw before. Okay, but this is, it's possible to get this point. Now, the previous expression tells me that the probability to get a type that is far is exponentially small. Okay, so when you increase n, this thing becomes denser. And in typically what you get when the empirical distribution will be, all points will be around the true distribution. Okay, and the probability that you're far away from here decays exponentially which are with a rate that is the, the relative entropy. Okay. Um, John, yeah. can I have a question? Please. So allowed in sense of what metric? Is it really a severe or it might depend on some other assumptions? Is, is this, okay, can you, re, can you repeat? Is it, you mentioned allowed and you plot it as a um, circle. No, no, it's not a circle. Yes. So, you're, so you're, the question you know, is what is now the metric you use? Um, it's a it's an intuitive metric. Uh, when when I when I draw here, I I, I I draw I draw something which is not very symmetrical as you see. So this is the the if you want these are the the points which are equally uh, probable mm -hmm. on Q and it's not symmetric indeed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah yeah. So the, the this this metrics and and I guess it was it was you Carol not speaking. So Carol yes. is an expert in this metrics in in probability space but also in the in the quantum space. Um, and it's really, it's very much related. I mean, you have metrics that come around from many different approaches. You can do uh, uh, hypothesis testing or estimation or uh, quantum communication with capacities. There are different notions of metrics that can arise. And here in, in the hypothesis testing, some of them arise and, and we will see a couple of them. Okay, but that's, that's a relevant question indeed. Okay. So this is now the, the, the first message is that the probability that you get in your experiment, a, a point here decays as this distance that is uh, the relative entropy and that it's not even symmetric. If you swap the argument, so if you sample, if the true distribution is this one, the probability to get an outcome like this one is dominated by this. But if, you, if the true distribution is here, the probability of get this point is not the same one. Okay, so it's not really a, a distance in the Euclidean sense. Okay, so there's a, a, a very important theorem also in the classical case, it's Sanoff theorem. So now I don't ask the probability to get a particular sequence, but they ask you something like, what is the probability that my, my outcome will be somewhere in this region, a whole region here? Okay, it's quite, intuitive and uh, not very complicated to prove that the, this probability again, the, the rate in which it decays is given by the, the distance, this distance, the relative entropy distance of the point which is closer to Q from this set. Okay, so you, you look at all points in this set which are, you, you compute the relative entropy distance to Q and you take the minimal one. It will be typically in the border and uh, and, and all your, the, the probability for all these events is actually the same in, in exponential terms in, in rates as, as the one of this event, okay? This will be important. And this allows really to get rid of a, a lot of uh, very funny dependencies, okay? We only care about the exponential rate. Okay, now in the context of hypothesis testing, this is a very important result also quite uh, straightforward, but it's very enlightening and very useful. It's the name on Pearson lemma. And now imagine that you have two candidate hypotheses, P1 and P0 and P1. And now you get a point here. You throw your coins, you compute your frequencies and in, you will get a point here. And now you have to decide whether you believe it's hypothesis zero or hypothesis one, okay? As I told you before, there are two types of errors, alpha and beta, and now it depends on the consumer in a way, if you want to have uh, optimized the combination of both, uh, one over the other, some, some function of both or whatever. But Neyman Pearson gives you a kind of uh, criteria that it's optimal in a very strong sense. So you don't need to really optimize one parameter 
but still it, there's a sense of optimality, which is the following. So you define now a very particular region. So I could, I could come up with any criteria, okay? I say um, all this region here with, a, I don't know, this funny shape and this even, whenever these outcomes come, I say it's P1 and whenever the rest, I say P0, okay? And I have to really optimize over all possible mm, by colorings of this triangle, okay? What Neyman Pearson tells me is that there's a very particular criteria and this is optimal in the following sense, okay? And the criteria is essentially looking at, at the ratio. So you get one point and compute the probability that this sequence was generated by hypothesis zero and the probability that this point was generated by hypothesis one. And you look if the ratio of two is larger than a given number. So essentially you're saying if, if P0 is larger of P0 of X, if the probability that you got this according to hypothesis zero is 10 times larger, T times larger than the probability that this event was caused by hypothesis one. Okay, so you're saying this hypothesis is 10 times more likely or some, some number. Okay, it turns out that such a criteria, and it's only one, it's a whole family. For every T, there's a, a family. It's optimal in the following sense that if you compute the error that you obtain with such a criteria of type one and of type two, then any other uh, criteria, this, this funny region that I put here or whatever, will be worse in the sense that if it's better, if the rate, if one error rate is, is, is smaller than the one given here, then the other one must be necessarily bigger, okay? So this is from all examples I've seen you, when you do linear combinations, when you minimize, one rate fixing the other one to be smaller than something. All this, we know that the optimal estimator will be of this type, a likelihood. Okay, so looking at likelihood ratios, it's the only important statistic in a way. It's the only thing that you have to remember from, from this is a function of, of X, right? Um, sorry, John, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Michael Schmeier is here. So, but like if you do just standard hypothesis testing, like you compute TV distance, right then actually just makes sense to to take the just to set roughly speaking t equal to one right you just check which probability is larger right and that exactly kind of... so all all the cases that you have seen and this is the typical thing that helps from measurement in the quantum case um it's a particular example i mean this is classical yet but we will see the, the quantum quantum part and, and and you will identify it even easier here but indeed in, in the case of symmetric uh, hypothesis testing where you have some bias or equal biases that you were saying, so each hypothesis is equally likely, equally likely, you just see which hypothesis is more likely, if one is more likely than the other one. So this parameter will be indeed one. Thanks. Yes. Okay. So this likelihood ratio, in the end, we want to see if the ratio is larger than a given number. So if you don't mind, I take the log at every side, okay? And now here the nice things happen, okay? Uh, of course, when, when all these kind of, uh, of concentration bounds or, or large deviation bounds appear because the, the underlying distribution of many samples has some structure, in particular is, is, is IID, permutation invariant, and this, you exploit it. And, and this becomes manifest here because the probability of getting a particular sequence is just the product of probabilities, okay? And if you have a ratio, it will be in the end like a sum, okay? So instead of having a product of things, since there's a lock, everything transforms into a sum of individual log likelihoods, okay? This is a sum over outcomes, if you look. If you have n tosses, you have n, out n outcomes, but each outcome, each xi is one guy in the alphabet. So it takes values, it can be A, B, or C. So I can substitute this guy and these arguments instead of by the number of samples by the index of the alphabet. And this means that I can just count how many times a given simple appears. This is empirical distribution, which is the number of times it appears divided by N. So I multiply by N. And here I have, instead of a sum overall, I just clump all terms together. And I have an object that I like because this is a probability distribution now. 
and I can transform it a bit trivially. And in the end, we see that the likelihood ratio is just, I can write in terms of our relative entropies. Okay, so it's the distance. I, I'm just checking if the distance uh, from my empirical distribution to P1 compared to the distance from P0, from P0, if this is larger than a given number, log of T. Okay, so this, this, the, the log likely, likelihood just translates into comparing distances in this simplex. Okay, so if we look at the, at the simplex that we have before, and you look at this, this likelihood ratio, we see that this, so this doesn't depend of my out, on, on, on my outcomes. No? It's just given this, this is my, let's call this G of A. Okay, and this is P of A. So this is like a, an inner product, no? My probability distribution, my empirical probability distribution times some G, which is given, it just depends on my, on my two hypotheses. And my criteria is saying if the overlap between P and G is larger than a given number, okay? So in, in, in my simplex, this is like, this is my G. I'm just check, checking if P times G is larger than a given number. So this means if I put this plane with uh, the log T here, the parameter, this is a plane. No? It's all, all points which have the same overlap with G. It's this plane, this hyperplane. Okay, so in my simplex, this condition, which remember is optimal in this strong sense, it's just a, a cut of an hyperplane with my simplex. So all this region will be, I accept probability zero and I, in all this region, I accept probability one. And it's a linear thing. It's very easy, simple, okay? So now I, using the tools and some of theorems, it's quite easy to compute everything that I want. Okay, so if, if I, for example, well, here I put another, if, if, if I change my parameter t, t, I just have a, a parallel transport of my, of my plane and the shift, this shifts my, my areas, okay? So I have this free parameter. It's only one parameter now. All hypothesis testing, I can, my, my choice of estimators is just tuned by this parameter t, which I move up and down, okay? So now if I want to, to minimize one type of error, I just have to look, for example, I want to assess the error that uh, this is confused. So my, my, my true distribution is this one. What is the error that I say a point here? No, this will be one type of error. Then I know that the, if the true distribution is here, the probability to fall in the red region is just given by the point in the border, which is closest to here. Okay, and this point, well, we know how to optimize this, no? This, this is well characterized, is this type of function. And if you minimize a uh, given function over P here, so, so satisfying some condition, you use Lagrange multiplier and you get a generic form from this distribution. So you know that the optimal will fall in this curve, which is characterized by this Lagrange multiplier. And how do you find this Lagrange multiplier? You just have to make sure that you fulfill the condition with equality, no? So this is how you find the optimal rate in the end, okay? Now, the different protocols, this still depends on T. So now, for example, if you want to do, I still have an example. I think I, I'm talking too much classical, but let me wrap up saying, okay, in, in the semantics hypothesis scenario, and this will become an important quantity. What we want to optimize is the probability of one type of error so that you accept the probability that you accept hypothesis zero, but the true hypothesis is hypothesis one. Okay, so this is the bad one, the bad type of error. Subject to, I mean, you, the only way to guarantee, I mean, I, I can have a protocol that never, that beta is zero, no? You, I always tell you that you're sick. In this case, then I, I will never, uh, <laughs> I will never be wrong when you're sick. Okay, but of course it's a stupid criteria. So in order to avoid this trivial strategy, you, you want to guarantee if you discriminate some of the good ones. So you say that the probability of detecting uh, healthy people is larger than, than one minus epsilon, okay? So you, you fix this quantity and this epsilon is constant and you minimize this other quantity, okay? In the end, this condition is quite rigorous because if you want this to be finite, you have to be close to here. And the distance that you get the error rate that this 
being this a true hypothesis, you get one point here, and the other one is dominated by actually the distance from P1 to P0, which is a, the Stein lemma, okay? If you would go a bit further to minimize this error further, this point will fall, P0 itself will fall out of this region and you will never detect it, okay? So you're kind of forced, there's a, a kind of a strong converse here. Okay, let me just show this plot with the classical thing. When you tune, so if, if, if you impose, you fix one error rate, one error probability below some epsilon, you minimize the other one. This is the Stein, these points here, okay? That you get these relative entropies. If you say that both errors are important in the simplex here, what you will try to do is both are important. So in the end, you will, the, the, the optimal point here is the one that uh, Remick was saying before, it's, or no, uh, uh, Michael, uh, it's right in the middle where the probability of this event to cause this is the same than this one with, when, when these two distributions cross, okay? And this is the Chernoff bound, the classical Chernoff bound, okay? And in between, you have a lot of, pro of other, uh, other optimal points, which are like asymmetric, but you fix not the probability of, uh, of alpha, to be a constant, but you can fix a rate, okay? Given that my rate of one hypothesis is smaller than something, minimize the other one. So then you interpolate and you have a whole family of points here. Okay, enough of classical. So what happens in the quantum case? So- well, Can I have a question, quick yes. question? Yes. So how does you analyze this if you have like more hypotheses? Well, it's, <laughs> so some, the, the general picture is the same. But now you can imagine that now you don't have just uh, uh, two regions. You don't have to divide your space of outcomes in two regions, but you have many regions, no? Yeah, exactly. So one thing that appears now is what, what is your criteria? I mean, there's, you can minimize the worst case, you can minimize the average probability of error. Mm -hmm. And so in the end now, it depends a lot on your criteria that the shape of these uh, decision regions will be different. Uh, in, in many cases, in the end, you can talk about rates and you can look like it reduces to the worst pair. Of, so if you want to distinguish a lot of hypotheses depending on the game, in the end, you have to look the two that are most difficult to distinguish. This is the one that will, you, makes you spend more copies in a way. But it really depends on your criteria and it, it's, it's a hard thing in general. Okay. So in the quantum, what do you do? You say, okay, the only thing is just I do a measurement and then after the measurement, you get a, a, a classical distribution, so I can do the same, okay? This, of course, it's not true because you can choose different measurements at every point, and not only that, but you can maybe make a collective measurement on this, okay? And the collective measurement, okay, if you do two copies, three, you can maybe optimize it in some way by some SDP and so on, but if you want to get general results for asymptotic scalings, this is very hard, okay? And it took a while for the community to, to find the, the equivalent result from what I told you in the classical case, it took a while. Okay, the, the first result that we saw is this quantum name on Pearson. And this is also holds in the quantum case. No? And it says that if you have two hypotheses, rho and sigma, and you choose a particular POVM, which is a projector, and this is the notation here, maybe you're not so, so this rho, these are all operators, T is a number. And now you compute this difference and you project on the positive part of this. Okay, so this, 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 this matrix here will have a, a positive component, I don't know how to call it. Yeah, positive, a part with positive eigenvalues and the other part with negative eigenvalues. And you project on the guy with the positive part of this. Okay, this P of M is special or this family, because remember we can tune T. This is special in the same sense as before. So any other P of M with any kind of outcomes and so on that you can imagine, okay, will be worse in the sense that if, if one of the error probabilities is lower, then the other one is necessarily bigger. Okay, so this still holds. Okay, and then just to summarize, in, in the end, after a lot of sweating and a lot of things, in the end, you get the same expressions, I mean, it's, it's even insulting, <laughs> than, uh, than in the classical case. But the methods, the proof methods, and the kind of uh, 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 even the, the, the tools that you use to prove it, and 
they they are completely different than in the classical sense. Okay, so uh, in in the Stein case where you fix a rate, you get the quantum relative entropy, which is just an extension of the classical one defined here. The problem is defined in the same way. So you you fix that the probability of success of one hypothesis is larger than a given number, smaller than zero, or larger than zero, and then you minimize the other. Okay, and you look at the rate, and then you get the Stein, the quantum Stein lemma. The quantum, you get the same, and you get an expression which looks, I haven't, uh, I, I didn't stop too much in discussing the, the shape of this Chernoff, but it has the same expression substituting, instead of P's, you put rows, and you're happy. Okay, and the same applies to, uh, to the Hefty bound. Okay, we now move to the sequential hypothesis. Okay, so now here we want to discriminate the two things, and but the toolbox is a bit different. It's not that I give you n copies and now tell me how well you can distinguish these two things. Okay, I I can ask copies on demand. Okay, I can take one copy, do whatever measurement I want, take another one. I say okay, I'm, I'm satisfied. I don't want more copies. Sorry, and then you don't have to pay for them. Okay. Um, so the, 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 the types of POVMs are different and the, the type of questions that we, what we might answer are different. So the, the bounds that I derived before, the Chernobyl bound and the Stein lemma, they tell you what is the error that you expect for a given number of copies. Okay, this is the, with the Chernobyl example. Of course, this tells you, it assesses you, it tells you how many, if you want a given error because you want to, I don't know, uh, set the criteria in, the, in your uh, hospital or you want to send a rocket to the moon and you want to make sure that the error is smaller than something or whatever, then what you do is how many copies do I need? You, you, you take it from here. You know that your number of copies that you will need will scale since remember that the error scales exponentially, the number of copies will scale as the log of epsilon. And the guy, the, the exponent that appear here is just the coefficient in, in front of this log. Okay, I'm, I'm just inverting the formula. But now if I look at this formula, I can think that maybe I can do better if I use sequential. So if, if the question is not what is the error given a, a number of copies, if I tell you, no, no, I want a given error, please, what is the best number of copies that I can make, okay? And the first thing you realize, especially if you're Bayesian, is that depending on the outcomes that you get, okay, some of them are more informative than others, as I said. So it could be, that if you do it sequentially, that you're very lucky and you can assess very well with the confidence that you're asked to, uh, what, is the, what is the hypothesis, okay? And then if you're sequential, you can stop, right? And it turns out that this, it's, this sometimes it can happen, but it's not a very rare thing, okay? It happens quite often that you get a gain. In fact, even if you, if you just compute the average n, the average number of resources that you get, you can save a lot of them, okay? You can save a lot of resources if you're allowed to stop in between, which is natural, no? You don't have to, if you can buy uh, your resources on, on demand, then it's clear that sometimes you will be happy with less, okay? And this is the, the whole gain in, in sequential analysis regarding hypothesis testing. Okay, so what is, the, what is the game that we play now is we get sequence of outcomes one by one, one after the other one. And then our criteria is saying, okay, I check that the probability that the given sequence, uh, I, I bet for hypothesis one, I want to make sure that this is the right assessment. I want to be sure that this is larger than a given, this is a probability of success, is large, is very close to one, say, one minus epsilon. John, can I have a question? Yes. So you measure each copy separately. So you, I mean, you perform a measurement on one copy or you, you can perform like- Okay, I, I'm copies. setting out the, now, if I remember correctly, this should be the, the classical case, okay? So in the classical case, it's given. The only choice that I have is to stop. When we go to the quantum, indeed, this question becomes relevant. Okay. But now it's just, I, I look and the, the outcomes come, no, I sample. But my, my freedom is whether I can stop or not. And my criteria is, can I guarantee that I, I can successfully identify, given my, my outcomes, that I can successfully put, uh, identify hypothesis one? If this probability is larger than one minus epsilon, I stop, okay? Or I can stop if I can say the same, if the confidence of the other hypothesis is also 
plus uh, one minus epsilon. I could put different numbers here, okay? But there's two thresholds. I want to be sure that it's this hypothesis or I want to be sure that it's the other hypothesis. If I cannot be sure, please give me another copy, no? And this, this there's no optimization to do. It's just a, a, it's a passive thing. I just uh, look at things and if I, if I can provide um, an answer, I stop. If I don't, I continue, okay? If you look at these things, and I think I will be a bit brutal and go quite fast. In the end, the only thing that matters, as you can imagine, is the likelihood, okay? And if you saw the likelihoods, remember before that if you take the log likelihood, it's very convenient because the quantity that you have to look at every step that you look is actually this probability of getting an outcome Q divided by this, the log of that. So you get a sample, and for every i that you get, you associate this, this number, okay? And this is the likelihood. So, and, and the sum, the, the after n steps, is just the sum of these individual steps. So if, if I look at my sequence, I toss a coin n times, I will, if I'm running under hypothesis one, this likelihood will grow like this, click, 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 click like a random walk. It's random because my outcomes are random. Eh? If I'm under hypothesis zero, this likelihood clock, 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 will go down as a random walk. Typically it has this drift. Of course it can, it could be that it goes up like this. Okay, but if you compute the slope of this, the expected drift of this quantity, it's exactly my relative entropy. Okay, between the two distributions. If the two distributions are very different, this log likelihood ratio will jump very fast. Okay, this criteria to stop that I fix here is just essentially when I do the log, uh, uh, the criteria that you, you pass a given threshold here or below. This is for one hypothesis and this is the other one. So I keep track of this random walk. If I pass this line, I stop. And then I, at the moment I cross it, it, it means, literally means that I'm very confident that the hypothesis one is the correct one, okay? Now the problem is that we want to invert the problem. It's, so we, it's not enough to look at the drift. We want to know what is the probability, the average probability that you end up in this point with it, that you stop in N or here or here or here, okay? Now in the classical case, there's uh, the valid identity, which maybe it's the only thing I want to enhance here, that says, so we want to know the sum. So remember, you have this random path and we want to know essentially the, the, the expected value, okay? Of the length of how much your traveler has done till it stops. This is the moment it stops. And the moment it stops is the moment it crosses this boundary. Okay, and, and therefore this is a stochastic variable. Okay, it turns out, and it is very elegant, that the sum from one to a stochastic variable of a given sequence of stochastic variables, I can write it under some natural assumptions that work here. Okay, as the expectation value of Z, of each of these Zs, which is, is the same, times the expectation value of this number of things. Okay, so it, before here, I was, uh, I was doing it the rate, I fix N and do the sum. So after 10,000 steps, the average, how much I have traveled. Now I look at the average distance that I have done after I stop, okay? And due to Walt, I can, I can decouple these two events like here, and this allows me to compute everything, else, okay? And in the end, the average stopping time, it's a natural one. So the, the average stopping time is really the time it takes for this walker on average to reach this. So it's the N, I need the slope, so it's given by this. Okay, log, this is log epsilon. So the time it takes to reach this guy is just the rate times N, and this is the value. So it's quite intuitive. Okay, now in the quantum case, you can do the thing and measure each qubit in a particular uh, if you want, you choose the measurement and you, you do the same trick. Now you have to optimize overall possible measurements and you get a kind of fixed, fixed measurement and you the best with fixed measurements. You can do, just apply the classical formulas. But we know that in the quantum case, as in general, I could take one copy, decide to stop. And when I stop, I have to say, I believe it's rho or I believe that it's sigma. Or please, I don't know, sure, please give me another copy. 
and then you measure these two copies and three and four and five, and this can be a weak measurement, remember? So I, I, I can still, my first measurement, maybe I don't want to destroy completely the, 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 my copy. I do a weak measurement, I preserve it, and then include my measurement and increase the size of the measurement. And uh, of course, the, the choice of measurement at the given level can depend on the outcome. So it, it becomes a hierarchy, which is very hard to characterize. Okay, so if you try to optimize this brute force, it's, uh, it's a killer, it's very hard. Okay, in the end, what we show, and I think I don't have too much to, to time to prove it, is that no matter what you do, okay, it's impossible that you stop before a time that is given by the Stein. So if, if I look here at the probability of continuing, this is the, the, so these POVMs have three outcomes in general, no matter what I do, either they tell me I stop and what hypothesis is this or continue, okay? Any, any type of other measurement I can, I can clump in this, in these three outcomes, okay? Then I can check that if I want to preserve my two conditions, and now here I come, the, the conditions of stopping have to be Whenever I stop, I, I have to make, be very sure that my hypothesis is one or very sure that my hypothesis is the other one. So this is one condition. And as you see, it's, it's type of, of, of this uh, whole level condition. But you have one whole level um, head stop, no? This is like the head stop matrix for those in the field. Uh, so I want to check, I have one for being sure that one hypothesis is is very, I'm, I'm very sure about its row. And the other one that I'm very sure that the hypothesis is sigma. I, I want to combine both. So it's a two-sided Neumann Pearson thing, okay? And you can see that under these two conditions, it's impossible, okay, using some strong uh, converse, uh, some kind of quantitative version of, 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 of strong converse results. Uh, you can show that no, no matter what you do, it's impossible that you stop with these guarantees before a point, and this point is precisely given by the, by the relative entropy. So this point here is given by the relative entropy. So if you, it's impossible that nobody stops sequential or not at a time faster than the, what the relative entropy will predict. Okay, so the same that the, this uh, asymmetric kind of setting. Okay, still now you have the problem. And, and, and then we also show that by kind of a collective block coding and using the results, of the measured relative entropy, we can show that you can attain this slope, okay? And the optimal measurement that attains this depends on sigma. So you can attain, you can be sure that it's a hypothesis if you do the right measurement. If you want to attain the other hypothesis with the same assurance in the same amount of time, you have to change the measurement. And this is a problem because you have to make a choice, okay? But luckily, and this was quite recent also, to a Mitchell and, and, and co-workers showed a particular strategy. So we proved one bound, the, the, the converse. And to a Mitchell in this paper, they showed that you can attain it. And it's a very natural strategy. So you start with a, a strategy that you think is a hypothesis uh, raw. You compute this likelihood in blocks, big blocks. Okay, and this will start going up. If it goes up continuously, at some point you will stop and this is optimal. It turns out that at some point this, this uh, likelihood switches sign. So you start believing that it's the other hypothesis. Then you change and make the optimal measurement for the other hypothesis. And you can show that asymptotically, this gives you the optimal error rate, okay? And to finish with this, in the end, what we see that if you do, so you, you win a lot. I, I have some results here, but in terms of, of resources, you can save, um, if you do, for example, symmetric hypothesis testing, instead of Chernoff, you can say one sixth of it, okay? A, a fraction. It's not that you go to super exponential or you change the regime, but you, you, you really, the, the number of copies that you need is a fraction of what you needed before. But more importantly also, and conceptually here, we saw before that the, if you do fixed measurement strategies, all your curves, all your points that you can access, all error rates are in this, in this curve here. If you do sequential, you can access all the area here. So you, you can attain all the optimal rates disregarding the, the setting 
asymmetric, anti-symmetric, uh, asymmet uh, and so on. Okay, so you can attain all this area here about the rates. Okay, uh, I think I, I don't have much time. So this is the, well, for qubits, you can compute some close expression. Maybe this is not too, too relevant. Just to finish with sequential uh, hypothesis testing, in the end, okay, there's no, no free lunch, there's no magic. What we prove is that if you look now at, at particular strategies, at the stopping time it takes, now the stopping time, this is when are you satisfied? When the hypothesis was H1 or when the hypothesis was H0? What is the time you take to, to reach a given threshold here? And this was a random walk, okay? You see that it's not, it's, it's, there's a histogram here, okay? The mean of the histogram is much better than the deterministic part, is what I just told you, okay? But you see that it could be that sometimes you, you, you ask for more copies, there's a given probability that you end up asking more copies than the deterministic one, okay? So you have to assume a risk that, uh, that you spend more than in, in the deterministic one. But on average, you will do much better, okay? So there's a, a trade-off here. Okay, now we move to, to, to a different setting, which in which sequential is not really, a, you know, entails a, a benefit in resources, but it's a qualitative importance, okay? So uh, an example is this change point problem, okay? In a change point, it's like you, you're drawing from a given distribution samples, okay? And at some point, something happens and this distribution changes, okay? You're, it can be uh, that you start treating patients or whatever and the distribution itself changes. And you want to detect the point where this change occurs, okay? And this is important because many, many statistical inference uh, assume that you have IID settings. So if there's a change, it might be drastic. If you don't detect it, it might be drastic, okay? And this is a lot of applications. Of course, changes are everywhere in our lives. And, and we want to detect it. So the, the first uh, thing we did is the most simple quantum change point detection is you have a sequence of states, zero that you know, and at some point they change to a different one. You have a source that changes and produces a different state, okay? And the task is to identify when it happens, okay? So we solved this part. We, th we saw that uh, asymptotically this probability of success you can identify with with a constant probability, independent of the size. So I give you a string, this, I ask you where the change occurs, the probability that you identify it perfectly, perfectly, where the change occurs is finite, okay? And it's a, it's a close expression, we know it. But this is, you throw the thing many times, you take the, the measurement of all copies, and the question is where the change occurs. So it's a kind of hypothesis testing with fixed resources. It's much more interesting and relevant if you do another type of problem, which is the quickest change point detection. So now you identify, you have to identify the moment where the change occurs as soon as possible. So if, if your sampling is from a fire alarm and it has some noise and it, it has a default noise when it's working, and then another hypothesis that is corresponding to the fire, say, then you want to detect not when it happened, not, it's not that you go to a track record and say, okay, yes, the, the fire started uh, two days ago. You want to detect it as soon as possible, okay? And this is very natural. And this you can only do if you are continuously monitoring and sequentially analyzing your data, okay? So now the, the figures of merits are, are different because now you, you, you know that the change occurs at some point and you want to minimize the time it takes for you to realize that this is happening, okay? Of course, if the only figure of merit is to minimize this time, then you will be yelling fire, fire every second, fire, fire, fire. And of course, if there's fire, you will, <laughs> you will not be wrong. But of course, it's, it's, it's a very trivial and uh, useless strategy, okay? So what you do typically is to fix a false alarm time the, the, the period after which you're allowed to say fire, okay? And given this fault alarm, minimize the time it takes for you to realize the change, okay? So classically, this has been solved by, by Lorden. And again, you have to look at the likelihood ratio. And in the quantum regime, we have some partial results. 
and surprise surprise you get you get very similar just changing the, the same expressions of this is the, the time it takes to realize it depends as the relative entropy between the two uh, hypotheses okay and this is now the the false alarm time Okay, but here it's not full complete and it's not yet published because the, the conditions that we need to impose are not as natural as the ones I put above or they are different. And we're trying to see if we can, if we can match them to have completely analogous problems. And I think I'm, I'm a bit over time. So I leave it here with, uh, with a big thank you and uh, for questions if there are any. Okay, thank you, John, for the nice uh, talk. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, can you hear hey, me? Yeah, this is Yarek. Mm -hmm. Hi, John. Hi. Hello. Uh, uh, John, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, uh, all those methods of, um, of uh, hypothesis testing, they have quite unexpected um, use in the um, studies of objectivity and quantum Darwinism, because basically we have to uh, we have to decide what kind of uh, what kind of states the um, uh, the environment encodes. So I I wanted to ask you: Is there any hope, or maybe there are some particular cases of um, extending the the methods beyond two hypotheses? Because you were basically like uh, following uh, Hellstrom, Holevo, you were basically testing between two hypotheses. So the the, the Basic hypothesis and uh, the uh, alternative. <laughs> I'm wondering if there is any hope to extend it to a more well finite number, but but more than two hypotheses. Um, so it depends. I mean, maybe maybe for your case, it, it could be it, it could be that you can contemplate what is called like. Um, Composite hypothesis testing, so that you, you know a set of hypotheses, in, but in, in the end, your solution, uh, you, you, don't, you don't want to say which one of them, you want to know whether it belongs to a given class. Uh, this... No, 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 pardon, 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 pardon for interrupting. No, I, I, really need, uh, I really need to decide which hypothesis. So I have a, I have a set of uh, n possible states, let's say. Uh, and possible quantum states, a finite family of quantum states, and I need to decide uh, with which state am I dealing. Yeah, um, I, I, it looks very hard, yeah. In, in general, it's hard to decide also what I said before, the figure of merit. In your case, I don't know if you would like to, to minimize the, the average error, say, or if, if you have a natural uh, prior for this hypothesis. I have a prior, but I don't know this prior, unfortunately. I'm in a really bad situation. Yes, I know. I'm in a really bad situation. I have a natural prior, which is given by the system environment interaction. It it, it generates, or, or or actually by the by the initial state of the of, of the system of interest. Uh, it generates a natural prior. Then the system interaction, system environment interaction encodes information in in uh, quantum states. So what the uh, independent uh, environmental observers get, they get with some probabilities, they receive states from some family, but they don't know these probabilities. Yeah, from the, uh, I think it's, it's hard and it's hard even classically. So it's, it's okay. uh, the, w w whenever you find solutions uh, hard classically, then it, there's, I mean, it seems hard that you can find uh, elegant uh, single letter formulas in the quantum case. Um, I don't know in your particular case, maybe going to continuum sometimes helps. So if, if you can rephrase it with a, a continuum set of parameters, so you move to estimation. Yeah, 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 this is what we have been doing right now. This is what okay. we have been fighting right now, but it's also not, uh, not easy because it's not, not frequentist and not Bayesian. I mean, there is a prior, but you don't know the prior. <laughs> it's, a, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite a mess. Well, well, well we, we are trying in the, in the discrete case, we are trying to, to get around the problem and we simply put a uh, very, very uh, strict condition on the family of states. We say that uh, asymptotically or in some limit, the states have uh, orthogonal, uh, orthogonal support. So this of course solves everything because they are simply one shot distinguishable. Yes. But of course, but of course, this is some sort of uh, idealized uh, 
idealized condition and, and, and in practice it's 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 never fulfilled so something that's that, my question something that might work i don't know in your case but uh it's to look at the worst case scenario mm. so you, you have a very in the end it's, it's super conservative no but it, it, it will tell you may, maybe it's too too harsh maybe maybe the worst case is really terrible but sometimes it helps to get some some kind of uh, bound or something useful the worst case okay okay thank you very much thanks uh, thanks again john yeah thank you okay so any other question I see. Okay, so maybe I will ask something. So but there uh, are many questions, Remy. There are hands read. Oh, read, okay. But you no, don't I, see it. Okay. How to find these hands? I see uh, uh, Michael uh, with yes. Mia was so I propose color. that people just ask questions. Uh, okay, Rafael. So maybe now you. Okay. So so because this is what what you mentioned in the end about this generalization to estimation, and also now you mentioned it to to Yarek. So, so do you have any intuition what would happen in an estimation case? Do you expect that also this, this expectation number of repetitions, this average number of repetitions could be lower than what we get, I don't know, from Bayesian analysis or from camera bound and so on? I, I, yes, uh, based, based simply on the fact that classically it happens already. So uh, a very- So classically, classically is the case for estimation, yes, yes as well? Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, this is what I want. Thank okay, you. now Michal, which one is? But I, so just to finish, I'm, 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 okay. I don't think uh, just I don't think you can you can use it to to go around your no goes of uh, methodology in a way. I, I think it will amount to to uh, a change in in the not in the scaling factor, but in the proportionality. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. I mean, unless you do, I mean, this is related to, and maybe you know, because I, I, I troubled you with this also with this probabilistic methodology that we did some time ago, where you try to, to optimize, say, the variance, but only in some, with a given probability. You want to get an outcome, you want to make a measurement that with a given probability, I can assess that the error is smaller than one of our Heisenberg limited. And this you can do, but of course, then in the other cases, you don't know, okay? Now what we do in the same, is it, it's the same thing, but instead of uh, saying, I don't know, I continue measuring, measuring. So you can relate it to this probabilistic methodology that we did in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You, yes. Uh, Carol? Yes, Carol. Yes, hello. Uh, the question is simple. If you go from classical case to quantum and change kullback leibler into quantum like Umegaki version, is there any need to use those generalized non commutative versions like Bielavkin, Straszewski entropies? You know, there's like square root, rho, sigma squared on the other side. Uh, like, well, in, in our cases, for the, for, um, it depends on the, on the type of problem that we have, uh, that, we, that you solve. Uh, but in, in, in our case also, we use, we use some kind of these uh, one shot uh, entropies with instead of, uh, with exponents and this sandwich kind of relative entropies, we use it yes. for the for the strong for the for the for proving that our strategy is optimal. But in the end, the closest formulas that we have are just trivial extensions, not the fancy square roots. But we we have to use it in, in the proof. Oh, and if, do you use any any like versions of generalized relative entropies? Yes. Yeah, so in, in the proof that is. Yes, for, so, so for this str strong converse, so this means that when you, when you show, so typically you show that, uh, so in the symmetric case, no, you want to make sure that the probability of error is smaller than a fixed number, then you minimize the error. The strong converse tells you, okay, if you would really push it hard and try to exceed this number, it's not that the, you will not defeat the probability constraint of error before, but you will actually always fail, okay? Mm -hmm. And you, the probability of error will go the other one that you in principle were constraining to be below one, it will go to one exponentially fast. And people have characterized this, this rate of the exponent. And this exponent is one of these Rennie type mm -hmm. uh, entropies. So I could imagine that if you try to get not the um, first order, uh, Asymptotes. You try to look at second order; these quantities might appear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, yep. yes. Um, 
to ask because something? Like yes, so yes. just quick uh, technical question. So do you expect that this sequential, uh, those sequential strategies uh, that can you can abort first uh, earlier, that protocol can be useful also for uh, certification? That is to say like the scenario in which you don't have prior distribution, but you have to decide kind of whether your object, let's say state is closer than let's say epsilon in trace distance to the target state or is better away than to epsilon from it. Because for certification of quantum devices is quite- uh, Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a nice question, yes. Um, I, my, my initial uh, guess, uh, it's that you gain something, yes. Uh, I, I, I cannot, uh, I can not prove it to you, but the, the reasons and the underlying reasons seem that it might be the case. No, because um, in the end, the promise is that the, 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 it, it, look, it, it looks more like a discomposite thing, no? That the promise is, is it the state or is it epsilon far away from the state, no? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I think I think it will it will hold again again it not not it would not change the scaling loss, and this is maybe mm -hmm. the big thing because most of these results you drop out these these factors no you you just look at dim dimensionality scaling and so on so mm -hmm. I don't know if the if the benefit you will see it in the scalings, this is another question. Sure, but on the other hand, for those you know near term applications if you can yes. make some savings it's always good <laughs> exactly yeah so in this case it would be would be good yes yeah that's a good question thanks okay so is there any other question so if not i propose to uh, thank the speaker again thank you all <laughs>